Thank you, Denise. And I want to thank you for organizing these wonderful webinars uh, that uh, are enjoying some support across the country. We have uh, a nice crowd here in New York, and I know you have one in Chicago, and then uh, over 100 people signed up for this, so I assume we'll have a pretty nice crowd on the internet. Um, first, I want to say this is a very special subject that's close to my heart. Obviously, I spent over 60 years in the Communist Party, and, uh, you know, this is Valentine's Day. It's something I want to say. <laughs> I love you all. I especially love my wife and my family so much. My, my mother-in-law is out here. And uh, I want to say that turn to the person next to you and tell them that you love them. <laughs> because this whole struggle is really, this is a family affair. You know that, right? All across the country. Hug your wife. Hug your husband. You know, say hello and that's good. I know it's been commercialized. This is nothing commercial. You will not have to buy a box of candy from me, honest. Thank you. Um, as I said, this my heart's full of uh, love and pride for the Communist Party. The more I learn about it, the more I experience it, the more love I have in my heart and confidence and pride in my heart. Because the fight that they have undertaken, they did almost 100 years ago. Next year, you know, our centennial was a great fight that upheld working people. And it upheld the rights of women, although we had to grow on that one. But it also upheld the fight against racism and for equality of the African-American people, which was a central question to the whole struggle for socialism. Um, you all should know that at the founding of the Communist Party, 1919, that's why next year will be uh, our 100th anniversary. Despite that there were a small number of African-Americans who actually um, attended the founding convention. I think I saw a picture one time of it, and really, you could count them. Um, and that's because at that time, uh, because of the great experience, the great explosion of, of uh, politics around the world with the Soviet uh, revolution and the Russian growth and building of socialism, the first country to do that, free education, medical care for everybody, subsidized housing, uh, and that they removed a very vicious uh, czarist government which practiced pogroms against the Jewish people and carried out racial oppression against all of the controlling uh, colonies around them. Uh, so when they won, everybody uh, who had a sense of justice and freedom and believed in a true democracy and socialism and all that were moved. Um, and so... That's the people who came here from this country, often escaping poverty and, and oppression and repression, were already drawn towards the, the left movement. But when they were put on the outside in this society, when the Communist Party uh, was formed and so on, they joined it. Um, but it was still a small party in the 1920s, but a very important party, as history uh, will show. Now, it's very important to note, some people think the communists just uh, happen uh, out of opportunism to embrace the fight for African-American equality. But actually, it was deep in their ideology, in the basic beliefs of the Communist Party was for the full, total, economic, political, social equality for African-Americans. Despite its composition, for example... Um, at the founding, the socialists and the communists split. The socialists split from the communists on a critical question, and that is the fight for Af against racism and for African-American equality. The communists believe it was intricately integrated or a part of the whole fight to change the society to a socialist one. 
But the socialists believed that it was maybe even a diversion away from that fight and that the black and other people who were oppressed had to wait until after socialism to gain their liberation. So in the great by and by, we'd be free. Meantime, they should join them and help them do what they want to do. Now, how are you going to join somebody who has segregated meetings? The old socialist car party. Debs was great. He got a million votes. But when he held meetings in the South for his presidential campaign that he got a million votes, black people had to sit upstairs. He did not challenge or they did not challenge the segregated nature of uh, the deep South and good part of the country as a whole. So um, there was a big battle on that. And it really was a battle around the strategic approach to how revolution just don't pop in people's head. It really grows out of their experience in resisting oppression. And if it doesn't do that, people go, well, what, what should I do with this then? So I, I tell you a story of, of Comrade Jim Jackson. James Jackson grew up in Richmond, Virginia. His father was a pharmacist. He went to Howard University. He was he was a registered pharmacist. Uh, and But when he was a teenager, he saw a sign saying there was a meeting of the Socialist Party. And he went out, whoa, I like that. I want to know more about it. By the way, he was the first black Eagle Scout in the whole state of Virginia. He, you know, came from a, quote, prominent family and all that. Ended up at Howard, as I said. But he went to this meeting, and he was directed into the balcony. So he immediately directed himself out the door. If they don't understand this, is what his feeling. If they can't figure this out, how the hell are they going to get to socialism? And he was right. And the thing that the Communist Party instilled in its members very young, when I came in 61, even though my life experience had given me a certain uh, understanding and, of course, commitment to the fight against racism and equal for equality and harmonize that with socialism, um, that apparently wasn't happening with the socialists. The other strategy, strategic question at the bottom of that is that the Socialist Party in the old days who were allies on many questions with them. We worked together with them. We were all in one party at one point, actually. Oh, Socialist Party was formed in uh, 1970, uh, 1870, I mean. And so by 1919, people had grown to the point where they saw the necessity for Communist Party. So the Socialist Party were extremely able street agitators. They were the soapbox party. Their form of developing support in the community was to get out there with a soapbox and have put their best speaker up there to talk about the issues of the day. But they weren't on some of the picket lines that were going on. They certainly were not a part in the fight against racism, but even some of the hardcore questions. And when the communists in the 1930s were putting the furniture back, fighting for relief, and growing like crazy, by the way, during that period, um, they were still agitating. And as William Z. Foster says, even in the 1930s upsurge, their memberships remained fairly stagnant. I think you can still find a Socialist Labor Party somewhere. They used to have book <laughs> uh, we call newsstands and so on. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that it never grew to the proportion uh, of the party nor to uh, the ma bring in masses in, much less black masses. But the party still had a problem. There were three very prominent African Americans who attended the convention. One was uh, the Jamaican uh, poet um, Claude McKay, uh, who um, was part of a group called the African Blood Brotherhood, which was based in Harlem and I think other places, they had about 2,000 members. They were actually an all-black movement that was led by Marxists. And the leadership of that movement eventually joined the Communist Party after working with Ben Davis and other people. And um, they, in fact, uh, ended up um, affiliating officially to the Communist Party of the United States. Um, another one was uh, Harry Haywood. Uh, Harry Haywood um, was a veteran of the First World War. I think he's with the Harlem Hellfighters. 
I think Harry Haywood may have had a Caribbean background also. Let me tell you, the Caribbean, Af the Afro-Caribbeans, they were a great foundation for recruiting uh, African-Americans, which they are too, but North Americans, into the Communist Party. They were the foundation in a lot of ways. They were the first ones uh, to come our way. Um, in addition, a comrade named Otto Hunsward, his last name, H-U-I-S-W-O-U-D, -U 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 Hunswood, I think it's pronounced. He was actually also from the Caribbean. He was from Suriname. And he was a kind of an export-import guy for, to make a living, but he was also a devout Marxist. And he came into the party. I came into the party in 1961. And Otto must have been 97. He was way up in age. He came and greeted our convention. He, he could hardly get his speech out, but he got it out. And he was still the revolutionary Marxist Leninist that uh, he was when back in the old days. That was, and, and therefore, a lot of the people who came from the Caribbean had an anti-imperialist understanding. They had known the national bourgeoisie of their country. In some ways, they had a higher sense of class and so on than um, maybe native born did, although native born also were fighting and militant. But the ideas of Marxism seemed to have filtered down to the Caribbean blacks more than here. That's just my guess, but I think that's probably what pretty much uh, happened. Um, so um, the party formed itself on the basis that the African-American equality and liberation was a special question that uh, penetrated the very heart of the fight for socialism, that you could not or should not and it was wrong to tell African-Americans hold off on the fight against racism.